you're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? I hope you are. I think I am. I don't know. Life just seems so busy at the moment. And my ass, because I've got stress because life is busy, my asthma's got a lot worse, which means I'm coughing. And it's not COVID coughing, but of course, I feel like I can't cough anywhere outside the house. So I have to just run home quickly and cough. Otherwise, I might get seized or something in a in a local town riot. You know, people, there's a person coughing on the street. So it's fine. Do I get a sign? It's not COVID, it's asthma. I don't know. Anyway, got my booster. Very pleased about that. There are some benefits to being ancient and ill. So that's a, that's something. But no sticker. There are other people that I've seen getting their boosters in certain parts of the UK who have had a, a like a booster sticker and they did not do them. I mean, you know, obviously I would rather that the NHS spend money on the actual vaccines and stuff than a sticker. But if there was one going round, then I'd be very keen to have one. But uh, no, no sticker. So so there we go. Um, but yes, that's everything. I don't know. I don't think I've got anything fascinating to say. Do I ever have anything fascinating to say is the question. I'm just trying to think, what sort of stuff have I been eating lately? Just the usual. I find I'm eating the same thing every day. I have the same thing every day for breakfast. I have the same thing every day for lunch. What is going on? Anyway, enough. Enough about that. Let's talk books because that is so much more interesting. Anyway, So the first book is called, now, are you ready for this? Anxiety is Your Superpower by Dr. Wendy Suzuki. And I have been waiting literally years for this book to come out. The next one is called Safe at Home by Lauren North. Uh, I got sent this one in September. It came out the end of September. And to my shame, I've only just read it But boy, have I got something to say about this book. Um, You do want to listen to to that. Next, we've got A Scandal in Bohemia. Um, It's a Sherlock Holmes story. But while it is, of course, by Sir Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle, it's also by Peter Culp um, because it's a graphic novel and a good one. Then I'm reviewing Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell got things to say about that as well. And finally, I'm reviewing A Village Murder by Francis Evesham. Now, I listen to this as an audiobook on Audible. It's one of the books that you get free with your membership. And I thought, well, why not? Lucky enough to get it free. Let's have a listen. And listen, I did. So quite a selection, I think you could say. And let's get started. So Anxiety is Your Superpower. I get this magazine called uh, The Bookseller. Normally, it's weekly. I'm very sad if it if it they miss a week. But anyway, it's usually weekly and they talk about books that are coming up maybe in three months time, maybe six months time, maybe even a year ahead. And I first heard about this book literally a few years ago. I think I've already said literally once already on this podcast. So that's where we are today. But anyway, they've been talking about this for a long time and I'd kept pre-order I pre-ordered it but then I kept getting these emails saying oh it's not going to be available for a while it's not going to be available and the date kept going back and back and then suddenly it was here and I just thought oh my goodness so this is for me it's such a different book it's well okay let's read the blurb Philippa let's be organized so anxiety is your superpower using anxiety to feel better think better and do better Let me read you the blurb. We live in an age of anxiety. Like an omnipresent yet invisible odour you've grown used to, anxiety has become a constant condition and a distraction that undermines our quality of life. Yes, anxiety is unpleasant. It's meant to be. And in the debilitating extreme, what Wendy calls bad anxiety, it's destructive. But most of the anxiety that humans feel is essential, not only to survival, but for higher brain functions formerly thought to be put on hold during anxious moments. Supported by her revolutionary research, Wendy will provide us with the neuroscience-based hacks 
for harnessing anxiety and facing it head on. The first will help address and calm anxiety so that you can enjoy the productivity it can bring. And the second will enable readers to channel anxious feelings into six uses for good anxiety, from increased emotional intelligence and focus to creativity and confidence. So let us read the first sentence as we all like to do. Now, do I do the introduction? Because often the introduction's part one. Yeah, uh, the, the, I'm not doing um, the first sentence of the introduction. I'm doing the first sentence of chapter one. What is anxiety? The daily stress of living can often feel like it's leaving us short of breath, literally and figuratively, as if getting through each day is like climbing a mountain. So what did I think of this book? Well, first of all, it's a book where I have written all over different pages notes from it. It's a book for me that I need to keep and continually refer to because it's got the different elements. It's got the toolkit, it's got all sorts. Um, and I just love this concept that anxiety isn't all bad. And yes, OK, if you're someone with very high levels of anxiety, it's not everything. It's not the complete solution. Um, get get uh, help from you know professionals. Um, but it's still... This book is just so unique and I was just thrilled to be able to read it and thrilled to be able to talk to the author, Dr. Wendy Suzuki, right now. So, Dr. Wendy Suzuki, author of Anxiety is Your Superpower, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. From the minute I saw the title some time ago, it was a book I knew I had to read and it seems so different to other books. Was that your intention? Yes and no. I, I um, initially got interested in anxiety even before the pandemic started because I noticed how my students at New York University, their anxiety levels were really going up. And it wasn't just the students, it was my friends, my colleagues, myself. And so as an academic, as a researcher, I got interested in that problem and um, uh, I dove in from there. And it was uh, what my my approach has always been. There's so many powerful things we can learn about neuroscience from neuroscience, learn from neuroscience about how to improve our lives. And I wanted to take that same approach for anxiety and it naturally evolved into this is this is a a not only an essential uh, human emotion, but it is actually critical for our survival. How did it get this bad rap? You know, it is doing useful things from a un, from mm. a neuroscience perspective, and um, it it went along that that direction. Um, and it evolved into the book that it is. Not that I was trying to, okay, I have to differentiate myself from all other anxiety books. It came out of my natural, you know, exploration. And then later, uh, people kept saying, wow, you, you know, you're the only one <laughs> that says anxiety can be anything but bad. So I was like, oh, great. Okay. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I could have that perspective. And it, it's so bizarre because literally my doctor just said to me when I'd been talking about anxiety, you know, that I couldn't do all that I do and do my job if I didn't have my anxiety yes. sort of to fuel me and focus me. And exactly. so it was so interesting to read something that normalizes it. Right. And helps you sort of focus that that power in a way. It is. And I think part of why this ended up that way is because, you know, you write about what you're most familiar with. I write about myself. And, and one of the things that differentiates this book is many other books about anxiety are about clinical levels of anxiety that are debilitating. Yes. And, and this is not very clearly not about clinical anxiety. It's yes. about um, the lower levels of anxiety, what I call everyday anxiety, that essentially all of us have right now at a heightened level. And uh, I wanted to write about it because that's what I know best. I have plenty of everyday anxiety. And um, I know the neuroscience-based approaches that I use 
to address it. And that's where I dove in. What, what else can we use? What haven't I considered before? Um, and it eventually uh, uh, evolved into superpowers gifts. Uh, it didn't quite start out that way. Uh, it, it, it was always going to be a, a more positive take on anxiety, but um, you know, it became a, a superpower. Um, if you want to point to a chapter, uh, read chapter four. And you will learn why uh, the, uh, it, the anxiety became a superpower. It was a, uh, you know, it was a tragic event that I I experienced during the writing of this book. I was sort of focused on anxiety, trying to think think it through how anxiety could be good. And um, I had uh, the terrible loss of both my father and my younger brother in a three month period. And I had to stop writing the book. I, I, I was grieving. It was, it was, um, you know, I, I felt like I was getting this master class in the most difficult emotions that humans go through and not uncommon. Most of us will go through these emotions. I went through it in the middle of writing this book and I came out realizing how powerful and how informative these uncomfortable and difficult emotions are. This wasn't the emotion of anxiety. It was the emotion of deep, deep grief. And Mm. um, I I really thought if I can learn from grief and learn to appreciate everything that I have in my own life and, and everybody that's still here, what can I pull out of the emotion of anxiety? that has fear and worry and anger associated with it. And that's how I ended up approaching this book in a, in a, in a unique way because of that experience. And the book is dedicated to my father and my brother uh, because it wouldn't have been the same book if I hadn't gone through that experience. And uh, it, it was very eloquently written. And I'm just, you know, sorry that you had to go through that to create what is an even stronger book? It, it's uh, you know horrible that you had to go through that, but I'll I'll just show you. People listening won't be able to see, but I, I'm afraid with with your book, I have uh, created. Let me just open the page. Oh. All my handwritten notes. <laughs> Love that on all different pages. Where I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to write this down. I've got to write this down. So I'm sorry for writing over your oh, book. Oh no, no, I love it. I love it. Love seeing that. (laughs) In doing my research, I was watching an interview with you in America and they were saying how four out of 10 people felt anxiety during the pandemic. Now, I was actually surprised because I thought that's really low. I'd have thought during the pandemic it would be even higher. And and I don't know how many people sort of accept the word anxiety and own it because the perception is that it's a negative. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, there are a lot of numbers out there. Um, the, the, um, the numbers for clinical levels of anxiety is that clinical diagnoses went up from about 18% of the population before the pandemic to about 30% of the population uh, yes. during and after the pandemic. And all groups were not represented equally. Young girls, um, teenage girls, high levels of uh, diagnosis of clinical levels of anxiety. Young millennials in their 20s, also very high. Um, African-Americans, also very high. So, so this, is, um, this is an issue that unfortunately doesn't affect people equally. Uh, and I, I couldn't find any good stats about everyday anxiety. There wasn't a poll, you know, um, but I have to assume that it's essentially all of us yes. <laughs> that have everyday exactly. anxiety. So I'm going with that. I'm just going with that. Especially during a pandemic, you know, that if there were, yes, if there were people that weren't anxious, well, uh, I, I want what they're taking, I, I think. What, <laughs> what response have you had to the book so far? You know, I think it is people are finding it refreshing, finding it hopeful Mm -hmm. in in so much bad news that we hear every time we turn around. And this the message, the true message of this book that I truly believe in is that you can use your anxiety as a superpower. You can harness that energy. And, um, you know, you have to do some steps. You have to turn it down. You have to use all the tools that I talk about to turn it down. 
But in the end, it is a protective mechanism. And one of the biggest tools is this tool of mindset that I talk about throughout the book that one can learn. If you have anxiety, it's a perfect opportunity to hone your skills of tuning up that ability to shift your mindset to help yourself, uh, not just in this area of mental health, but in all areas of your life. And so it's, um, yes, it's an optimistic look, but it is a science-based and it is um, it, a true look. I, I, I believe that everybody uh, can use these superpowers because I've used them. So it's not, uh, it's not something that, you know, only, uh, only for the elite, it's for all of us that might have some everyday anxiety. And one of the things you talk about, and obviously I don't want to give the essence of the book away, people should buy it and, and read it, but a phrase you use that stood out to me is a tolerance of discomfort. Yeah, yeah. Um, and perhaps not overreacting. I mean, I'm I am head of overreacting, I have to say. So um, I, I was very interested in that. And, and that is one of the tools to, yes. to manage things. Is, is yeah. that right? It is. And, you know, this gets to one of the things that I was most surprised at when I, um, in the process of writing the book, because I found myself um, first realizing that I was and continue to be an anxiety denier, denier. I'm like, yeah, I have a little bit of anxiety, but you know, let's let's dive into it for everybody else that has anxiety out there. And then as I was going, it was like, oh my God, I have ang- so much anxiety, I didn't even realize. So yes, I am truly an anxiety denier. But the thing that surprised me even more is in the process of writing the book and developing all these tools, I found myself making friends with my own anxiety. Because if anxiety and these uncomfortable emotions are truly protective, then you should be grateful. You should be, uh, you know, you're warning me about something. What are you warning me about? And that's what I truly found myself doing. Um, A wonderful therapist and coach friend of mine uh, has this great image. And um, the image that she gives her clients, who many of them suffer from anxiety, is that those difficult emotions, instead of being that, that big rock around your neck that you're just dragging around with yourself, what if they were like a, a little kid pulling on your sleeve saying, hey, this actually is kind of important for you. Look here. Pay attention here. And just re reframing, changing your mindset around what those uncomfortable emotions are telling you. I'm not going to get rid of the uncomfortable emotions. Fear is still going to feel that way in your stomach or wherever you feel it. But if you change what it's telling you and how it's telling you, instead of hammer over the head, little, little pull on the sleeve. It, that is that is what I naturally started feeling myself doing. And I loved her image of a little kid saying, mm-hmm. hey, you know, uh, um, mom, I need I need help over here. Oh, OK, OK, let's look over here. Let's pay attention here and see what we can do. Yes, which again, as the book says, it's a positive, not a not a negative. But again, yes. as you said at the very beginning, this is this isn't high level anxiety where yes. you need um, professional support. This is exactly, exactly other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, can I can I just say that it's funny that that doing all these interviews, I always try. Okay. Please be sure I am not a doctor. This is not for clinical anxiety. I make it really, really clear. But then later on, people are like, well, if I have clinical anxiety, I could use every single thing in your book, can't I? And I'm like, actually, you can. Yes. yes. <laughs> so that's even yes. a, another mm. way to reframe. Yes, I don't want people to only use this if they yes. need clinical help, go get clinical help. But can this be used as a support? Absolutely. So that's also a wonderful message that I want to get. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Can you tell when you meet somebody how anxious they are? Are you sort of subconsciously looking for the signs? You know, I am, but at the same time, you know, there are so many signs. It can be worry. There can be a lot of uh, uh, awareness, or it could come out as anger and just pissed off. Um, so yeah, I guess I am getting more, more familiar 
uh, with those signs, but they, they come in lots of different ways. And that's the other thing I've learned about it, even in myself, that is that anger, uh, where is that anger really coming from? Um, fear or, uh, or something else. And oftentimes it is, it is anxiety based anger. And you mentioned this word resilience as well in, mm. in the book. Um, and I admit, I used to see it as a bad word, something, you know, you have to be. Whereas uh-huh. actually, again, it's it doesn't have to be. It can be a positive. Oh, yeah. I've always considered the word resilience as, as a positive. And I feel like, you know, especially for anxiety, we underestimate our ability to um, build resilience. Uh, In fact, all of us, whether you have this mindset that anxiety can be good and you can use it or not, guess what? You are getting through your anxiety because you're still here. You're still trying to move forward. And um, um, in good anxiety, you would say, high five, great job. Look at all of these anxious situations that I just got through okay, maybe I didn't get through them in the most elegant way, but I got through. That is a penny in my resilience piggy bank. And the next time I'm going to get through and I'm going to sweat less. I'm going to get through and I'm going to um, do it slightly more elegantly because I'm learning how to turn my anxiety down and look at these situations and um, kind of uh, help myself get through guess what? All of our anxieties, they come up over and over and over. We often, we, we rarely come like, Oh my God, I'm so surprised that I'm anxious now. Right. <laughs> no, you, you can predict it months ahead of time on this day. I will be anxious. <laughs> so that's a good thing. You can prepare, you could help. You can use all the emotional regulation tools that I talk about in Good Anxiety to prepare yourself and use your creativity, which I also talk about in the book, to um, address it in a new way. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but gives your, give yourself credit for trying it a different way. That's a huge, huge, important step. And it builds that muscle of not only creativity, but that's part of your muscle of resilience too trying to not address the anxiety provoking uh, situation that you've gone through a million times in your life in the same way. Let's try it in a different way this time and see what happens. And you talk about the coping mechanisms in the book. Yeah. Did you know when you started writing the book that that those were the coping mechanisms you were going to use or did they evolve? I mean, particularly through your grief, you know, Mm. Did some of them surprise you, I suppose, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, Some of them were um, the coping mechanisms. uh, I mean, so I I consider the coping mechanisms the, the toolbox that we ended up developing. And that was, yes, surprising, fun, challenging. Like I remember sitting down, it's okay, today is toolbox day. What what can, what have I used that I didn't realize? What can I use? And so really pushing myself to come up with not just the regular tool. So uh, of course I was going to talk about exercise. I study the effects of exercise on the brain and meditation, lots of evidence there, but it would be a boring toolbox if there were two tools, exercise and meditation uh, <laughs> in there. And so I had to get, I knew I had to get creative and I knew I wanted to get creative to be able to, you know, address all the different um, points of view out there. And so I got creative by bringing in, getting inspired by a book that I found at a coffee shop about all of the positive self tweets that Lynn manuel Miranda has sent to himself. Did you know there's a book out there that you could buy on Amazon? And so I talk about it in the Ooh. toolbox. Um, I didn't even notice that one. I've, yes. Ah. So find it, find it in that part three. Uh, it's, you know, a uh, tweet like Miranda. Uh, uh, what, what would you tweet to yourself if you were Lynn manuel Miranda and you were giving yourself a positive self tweet? I love that one. It's so fun. It's yeah. like, you know, um, and then the other one that I, uh, that I'm most proud of is uh, a real science based one that was truly developed to specifically a- as an innovative new tool for this book. And it is the tool of, um, 
um, joy conditioning. And um, so look for it in part three of the book. Joy conditioning is really developed because of my almost 30 years of study of how new memories are formed in the brain, our memories for facts and events. And uh, it's also it was also developed as a direct counter to fear conditioning that we all experience all the time automatically. Fear conditioning is so, you know, when I lived in Washington, D.C., my my apartment was broken into and fear conditioning is that fear that every time after that, uh, that happened, every time I was going around the corner to see my door, I would get the image of what the door looked like when it was crowbarred open. And I couldn't get rid of that. And, and that was automatic fear conditioning. It's also a protective mechanism. We, we gather these throughout our lifetimes and that's just kind of depressing. It's like, how come we don't have something that, that gives us joy? Well, we do. And so I came up with joy conditioning. It doesn't happen automatically, but this is what you can do. The, the idea is to go through your memory banks, your personal memory banks, and think about the most joyful, the most funny, the most amazing experiences that you've had on vacation with your family, with your friends. And um, those memories were encoded, were strengthened by a structure called the hippocampus, including all those wonderful emotions that came with it. And we know that to strengthen that, the best way to do it is to revivify those memories, relive them. And I started to realize, oh my God, there's so many good memories that I have that I haven't thought about in years. Which one am I going to think about? Um, the other extra credit uh, trick for all you memory neuroscience nerds out there is that we know that olfactory um, memories are particularly evocative. So, you know, if you have a memory associated with the smell of an orange, that's particularly good. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to, you know, smell an orange to revivify that memory. You don't need the orange. You don't need olfactory uh, stimuli. Any wonderful memory would do. And all you have to do is rethink about that, re relive that memory. And so what you're going to be doing is re strengthening all of those wonderful, joyous emotions that you had. And that is something you can do for free. It's going to allow you to kind of travel back in time to the most joyous parts of your life. And that is my antidote to fear conditioning. And it it's, it's brilliant and it sounds brilliant, yet we are conditioned. Well, I certainly am when I've got something I'm anxious about to imagine the worst case scenario of what could possibly go wrong and then nothing that happens will be as bad as that. Yes, I I have done that as well. And that is partially a protective mechanism. So if you imagine the very, very worst, then you're never going to be, you know, surprised in the bad way. Um, but Again, you can use your conscious, you know, projection and conscious imagination um, to counter that with imagining the best possible scenario mm -hmm. that can come from this. And we do not spend enough time doing that. If you if you approach things in fear and just trying to, OK, I'm just going to defense against the worst possible thing that you know, cuts off roads for you to pave the road to the best possible thing, including thinking it, imagining it, visualizing it. Very, very powerful to um, make these things, you know, you can't, it can't come to existence unless you think about it, unless you imagine it. So very powerful tool. Wow. It's just uh, wonderful to hear you talk about it. I could talk to you for hours, but I won't. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> Just a couple more questions. Sure. E exercise. You've mentioned it. Obviously, the book yeah. talk, talks about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we could we all appreciate the benefits of exercise. And yet it's quite hard when you're in your hole. Yes. It, it's almost the hardest time to actually do that. Um, right. Um, right. Again, the book is a helpful, not a push, but an encouragement. To exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the key point that people don't realize is um, they think exercise is, oh, I don't have time to go run a marathon. 
you want me to exercise? Come on. And it's not, that's not what I mean by exercise. In fact, I'm not going to use that word anymore. We're just going to use movement. So can you bring a little bit of movement into your day? Uh, I know I spend a lot of time sitting right here. I'm at my dining room table and um, I, I happen to work out right over there uh, using video workouts, but uh, I also uh, walk around the table when I need to stand up, get your blood moving. If you have even a little bit more time, go outside, take that sun, get that mm. movement in, do it in a fun way. I use the songs that always make me want to get up and dance when, uh, uh, when I have to suppress it, when I'm in public, when I shouldn't be dancing in the subway. <laughs> and I put that music on and I just move here, you know, dance like nobody's looking. Well, nobody's looking at me. I'm in my dining room by myself. And um, that, that, it counts as, as movement, uh, work it into your day, work it into your shopping. You have to go shopping, walking around a big supermarket, take an extra lap or two around that also counts as movement for your body. And here is the secret sauce. Every single time you move your body, you are giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals. Those neurochemicals include things you've heard of, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, endorphins. That is why moving your body, including walking around the supermarket, will make you feel better. It's easy to get those mood boosts. They are reliable. They are um, uh, they are a powerful motivational and life tool or hack that everybody can use, and it's free. So that's my best pitch. Mm -hmm. Let's see if people people use it. <laughs> but I I love the phrase movement because when you're lying on the sofa <laughs> eyeing up the box of chocolates, thinking I, I'm too anxious to put lycra on. It, yeah. It's not about that. It's just it's not about that moving. Yeah. It's just moving. And, you know, I'm a very practical person. My one of my big lessons during the pandemic is that house cleaning is movement and it's actually really aerobic. Um, and so I, I like got two things done at the same time. I got my workout done, uh, arm work when I'm dusting all of my, you know, uh, shades, uh, you, you can't see me, but I'm doing these, uh, uh horizontal movements yeah. because you have to dust <laughs> in this way. It's actually a really good arm, arm, uh, workout. And so, um, I added that to my movement, uh, um, repertoire, uh, um, specifically during the, during the lockdown. Fantastic. So what's next? What, what great book are you coming up with next? Well, this is a secret, so you can't tell anybody. Okay, but, well, I uh, won't. <laughs> <laughs> so we are um, thinking about the topic of bravery, the neurobiology of bravery. And um, it it's a theme that has come up in my two previous books, uh, uh, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, and then this one, um, Anxiety is Your Superpower. Um, I, I'm fascinated with this and I think it's another topic that, uh, that is inspirational. And so it meets my criterion. Can I, uh, talk about the science about something that could help improve people's lives that can help them bring more bravery into their lives. So Wow. Um, that, I'm sitting up. That's what we're thinking about. With that, that sounds <laughs> so intriguing. And we should say for listeners that aren't in the UK, your book, Anxiety is Your Superpower, has a different name. Can you just say the name of the book outside of the UK? Yeah. So uh, in the United States and several other places, it's called Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion. So it's the same book. If you see it on Amazon in two different names, they're both the same book. It's the same one, just different titles, depending upon where you are. Well, yes. Dr. Wendy Suzuki, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. So now let's move on to the next book. And this is called Safe at Home by Lauren North. Let me read you the blurb. Anna James is an anxious mother. So when she has to leave 11-year-old Harry home alone one evening, she can't stop worrying about her daughter. But nothing bad ever happens in the sleepy village of Barton St Martin. 
Except something goes wrong that night and Anna returns to find Harry with bruises she won't explain. The next morning, a local businessman is reported missing and the village is sparking with gossip. Anna is convinced there's a connection and that Harry is in trouble. But how can she protect her daughter if she doesn't know where the danger is coming from? Let me read you the first sentence. Uh, oh yeah, so um, uh, Halloween, Village Girdis group chat, Saturday the 31st of October, 1845. Me. Has anyone got Harry with them? She hasn't come back from trit or treating yet. Oh, yeah, so that it opens with a sort of a WhatsApp group uh, conversation. OK, let me put the book down. So... There's a significant serving of humble pie I'm going to have to eat with this. Uh, may not have escaped your memory uh, that I said uh, a couple of months ago, maybe, that I was over psychological thrillers that I didn't want to read anymore, that I just wanted something different, fresh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. OK. What I should have done is sat down and read this book and then I would have been able to say to you straight away, well, actually... There is a book that's different, fresh and super, but I didn't. And uh, I am, yes, very sorry. I will write out a hundred times, fill up, uh, pay no attention to your own thoughts. This book, I loved it. I listened to some of it as audiobook. I read some of it. It, you, you think you know where you are and you're not. It's not one of these books. Oh, I was watching something recently where the whole time it was like, how is this going to end? And then it ended with some a character suddenly arriving that I hadn't known anything about for the whole, you know, the the 95 percent of the story they hadn't mentioned this character and then oh this character appears and oh this is this and this is that I'm just like no you have taken my time my precious time and messed me around this book doesn't mess you around well it messes with your head but do you know what I mean it's oh it's just great really good tightly written contemporary um meaningful, gripping, fast read. I don't mean that in a bad way, just what's going to happen next? Um, believable. I like the use of these WhatsApp group conversations and then different things going on. There were interviews and all sorts. It just, oh, I was very concerned for Harry and I'm not going to give anything away. Um, so as a as somebody who's immediately concerned about how things are going to end, you know, the book puts you on edge, but it puts you on edge in a safe way. You're not, you're not reading therapy, <laughs> needing therapy, I should say. Reading therapy? Dear, dear. You're not needing therapy as you go alongside it. But of course, if you do, you can now read Anxiety is My Superpower, can you? There you go. Um, uh, safe at home, Lauren North. If you like a psychological thriller, if you don't like a psychological thriller, read this book. Very, very good. One of my books of the year. Lauren North, you are a very clever person to write this book. And you're clearly you are just getting better and better. I mean, your other books were good, were great. But this is just like, wow. And I think it was Claire Saunders who messaged me saying, have you read this book yet? It, I thought it was brilliant. Thank you for, for the push. Um, wow, great book. Uh, immediately one to, to talk to people about. Well, funny, I suppose I'm talking to you. Oh dear, deep breath. But uh, yeah, safe at home, Lauren North. Girl, you can write. You really can. So there we go. And next we go on to Sherlock Holmes, A Scandal in Bohemia. Uh, let's read the blurb. Sherlock Holmes meets his femme fatale in one of his most famous adventures. The beautiful Irene Adler, perhaps the only woman in the world who can get one over on the greatest detective the world has ever seen, is once again on the side of crime, but maybe not everything is as it first appears. Uh, Peter Copel masterfully weaves events that seem unrelated while simultaneously solving two cases. The the deadly danger of the speckled band and a foolish mistake by the king of Bohemia. The story takes place uh, at the turn of the 20th century, a time of revolutionary inventions, precipitous events, ruthless criminals and the invincible Sherlock Holmes. Um, how many pages is this? It seemed like yeah, 150, 155. I enjoyed it. It's a good graphic novel. Um, I just, yeah, it's a great way to read one of the stories that I won't get 
time I imagined to sit and read the whole the whole thing. I thought the graphic novel was great. Um, it had everything that I need. Would I read more in this series like this? Yes, I would. I mean, I'm skimming through my review, but I just thought it was really good. It's simple enough. Excellent. Uh, but now we come to one where, oh, I don't know. You're all going to shout at me with this. Hamnet, Maggie Farrell. I had put off reading it and I've put off doing this review, but I'm going to have to do it. If I had a headline for my review, it would be The Case of the Overhyped Book. If I hadn't read all the reviews, all the awards, all the everything, I would have loved this book. I would have taken it at face value and thought it was great. But because every person with a pulse who's read or listened to the book has gone on about how amazing it is, I'm afraid in my imagination, it was just like, you know, the best Maggie O'Farrell book ever. Um, I mean, I thought there's a disappearance of Esme Lennox. I prefer that one of Maggie O'Farrell. This one, I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. And and I think it, the problem was that just I, I expected too much. You know, everyone's been saying, oh, the tears I've wept while I've read this book. And this book traumatised me so much. I kept waiting, thinking, come on, then make me cry. And and it didn't. And I'm really sorry. Let me read you the blurb. On a summer's day in 1596, a young girl in Stratford-upon-Avon takes to her bed with a fever. Her twin brother, Hamnet, searches everywhere for help. Why is nobody at home? Their mother, Agnes, is over a mile away in a garden where she grows medicinal herbs. Their father is working in London. Neither parent knows that one of the children will not survive the week. So let's read the first sentence. Actually, there's a historical note, which I'm going to read at the beginning. It's quite short, so bear with. In the 1580s, a couple living in Henley Street, Stratford, had three children, Susanna, then Hamnet and Judith, who were twins. The boy, Hamnet, died in 1596, aged 11. Four years or so later, the father wrote a play called Hamlet. Well, it does, that does give me all sort of chills then. And it also talks about how Hamlet and Hamlet is the same name, uh, particularly at that time. Right. First sentence. Well, a couple of first sentences. A boy is coming down a flight of stairs. The passage is narrow and twists back on itself. He takes each step slowly, sliding himself along the wall, his boots meeting each tread with a thud. Now, I, I really enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the book because it was different, because you know that this death is coming, um, but you don't know the circumstances. I like the fact that it involves Shakespeare and it made me learn more about him as a character. You learn things about him even when he's not being mentioned in the story, which was interesting in terms of sort of how he treated his family. Um but I think because of all the reviews, my impression was that the second half of the book would be a big sort of ta-da and the tears would come then. There was a lot more sort of action, if you can call it that, a lot more change, dramatic change in the first half. And then the second half was just the, the, the knock-on effect of grief, the follow-on of that. And, ah... Oh, See, now I think about it, I think I enjoyed it more than I did. But that just comes down to expectation. Right. So just assume that this is a good book, a decent book, and you will love it. You will love it so much you want to tell everyone about it. Have lower expectations than I had and you will love it. That's terrible. But that that's that's my honest review, I'm afraid. So there we go. Uh, let's put that one down. And then finally, we come to A Village Murder by Francis Evesham. As I said earlier, this is an audio book. I got it free on Audible. I just thought, right, there's all these free books that you can now get. Sorry for the paper noise. I've got this new microphone and I'm not sure if it's working very well. It picks up all the paper noise. There, I'll put the paper down so you can't hear it. Um, yeah, I just thought you can get all these free audio books if you're a member of Audible. So why aren't I making more use of them? Um, it's a shorter audio book. I think it's about five hours. Here's the blurb. An English village can be deadly when your past catches up with you. In the beautiful rural Somerset village of Lower Hembro, crammed full with English eccentrics, something is amiss. Landscape gardener Imogen Bishop has spent the last 30 years trying to forget one fateful school night. But when her estranged husband, Greg Bishop, is found dead in the grounds of her father's Georgian hotel, danger threatens to overwhelm her. 
Retired police officer Adam Hennessy, hoping for a peaceful life, running his traditional Somerset country pub, finds himself drawn into the unfolding drama in the hotel across the road. Imogen, Adam and Harley the stray dog form an unlikely partnership as they try to untangle a knot of secrets, solve a murder mystery and bring a killer to justice. OK, chapter one, The Plough. Adam Hennessy rose early. He had beer taps to polish, a bar to wipe clean and optics to fill. He yawned. He needed to find another barman fast. The plough had heaved with thirsty locals last night and he'd been run off his feet. I thought it was a, you know, it's a free book. Someone has spent so much of their time writing this and it's for free. I thought it was well narrated, well written. Um I probably listen to more of Francis Evesham's audiobooks as well. I certainly would enjoy them as an as an audiobook. It it's not when I say, oh, it's a cozy crime, that makes it sound like it really is cozy. And it's not. Um, but it is that sort of sort of cozy village crime, if that makes sense. Um so yes, if that's the sort of thing that you're into, I yeah, I commend having having a listen or or having a read. You can get it on um, printed book, ebook, all all sorts. It's uh, yes, a, a short, a short, pleasant stray into village crime. So there we go. I think I've covered everything today. I've got to grab the books again. I'm sorry for the noise, but if I stop recording. Who knows what's going to happen? I need to just keep the pace and momentum going so that this is done. <laughs> so the first book, wow, Anxiety is Your Superpower by Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Dr. Wendy Suzuki, no less. Great book. Then we had Safe at Home by Laura North. Ooh, good book. Uh, then we had uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Peter Copple's book, Sherlock Holmes, A Scandal in Bohemia. That's a graphic novel. Enjoyed that. Then Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell. I did enjoy it. Well, if you can say enjoy for a book that's about grief, it was a good book. It was just the reviews had hyped it a little bit too much for me. And finally, the audio book, A Village Murder by Francis Evesham. Well, I need to go because I've got books to read, things to do. I've got a really good author to talk to you about next week. Really good books. Just lots, 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 lots. And we are approaching the month of December, which is very exciting. Um, so, Look after yourselves, take care, and I'll speak to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon. <laughs>